students and welcome to News at Nine. I'm Devere Dudley. And I'm Natalie DeFord. Here's a look at our top stories. The PLU Food Symposium advocates for healthier options for local families. A PLU chef heads to LA to compete in a culinary battle. And Sports Talk updates us with what's new with women's sports. All that and more next on News at Nine. On Monday night, members of PLU Swing Club gathered in the CK room to not only share their love for dancing, but for fairy, ta fairy tale characters as well. Uh, this is one of the more fun uh, experiences that we get when we, when we do giant dances, because we'll do Halloween dances where everyone can do costumes, we'll do Christmas dances where everyone dresses in red and green, you know, the traditional colors, and you know, other stuff like that, but this is the first one where we've had, like, just dress as your favorite character, and that one's really fun. Uh, the character that I chose, Ron Stoppable from the Kim Possible television show, uh, his hair was blonde and I uh, did my best to get it that color. Now everybody's here and they're all having a lot of fun dancing to the to the Disney music. It's just a really cool place to come and learn how to dance. It's really welcoming. You can have any experience to come. We have a beginner lesson if anybody needs it any week that we meet. Um, and besides that, there's just a lot of really cool people. When I came here and found out that there was a swing club, um, I was really excited. It was actually one of the reasons that I came here. <laughs> The reason that I started swing dance was because um, people are always freaking about, uh, oh, I'm not going to be able to dance at my wedding. I know how to dance at my wedding now, someday, so. If you're interested in joining Swing Club, they meet every Monday night at 8 p.m. in the cave. PLU's second food symposium kicked off Wednesday night with various speakers, workshops, presentations, and of course, food. We talked to Rachel Haxtema, who is working with CCES to bring healthier food options to low-income families in the area. So I'm Rachel. I work in the Center for Community Engagement and Service. I'm actually an AmeriCorps VISTA volunteer this year working on a project we call the Healthy Parkland Initiative. So we're working on ways to get healthy food to low-income people in this community. One of the projects that I'm working on with PLU and Trinity Lutheran Church is um, the community meals. And so we do these community meals once a month. And this month we have a special one for the food symposium. And this month our special meal is um, we're trying to find as much local food as possible. So that's what we're doing tonight is chopping up some squash from the garden across the street here at Trinity. They call it the Garden of Edible Grace. And um, it's going to be roasted and used in a hearty salad for Thursday night's dinner. But um, yeah, so the Food Symposium is a community event. It's kind of initiated by the philosophy department. They did a food symposium about two years ago where Erin McKenna coordinated it and there was kind of a focus on production of food and animal ethics. That's her area of expertise. Um, this year we're focusing a little bit more on community issues around food. So mm -hmm. um, we're including community partners and farmers and leaders around farm worker issues and um, sustainability, local businesses, things like that. So my name is Xin Ying Wang. Um, I'm volunteering cutting squash. <laughs> I'm preparing the dinner for the food symposium on Thursday. I heard about this event um, through because I was on CCS email list because last year I was volunteering as well. So I'm on their emailing list and and I got the email and I thought it was it would be fun to come and prepare the dinner for the community. So. And on Saturday, there's an opportunity to work in the community gardens here at Trinity and at PLU. Um, all the food from both gardens is donated to the food pantry here, and it's a great way to learn about gardening and see um, how to grow food in the Pacific Northwest. Anyone interested in Saturday's garden work parties can sign up at the PLU Philosophy Department's website. A chef from Dining and Culinary Services will represent PLU later this week at a national culinary competition competition. Sue Chef Chuck Blessum flew to Los Angeles on Tuesday to compete in Flavors, an annual competition put on by the National Association of College and University Food Service. The competitors will work on lobsters as their main dish. They are judged on organization, professionalism, hygiene, and technique, as well as the overall quality of their final product. 
Blossom got into food service at an early age, working as a dishwasher at a country club, but got serious about it when he realized becoming a chef would allow him to travel first around the country, then around the world. My passion for food, being in the Northwest, with every, where everyone is so conscientious about how they consume and where they consume, uh, it's just kindled this huge fire of, of I guess culinary design. Chefs from POU have competed in the NACUF's competition since 2007, and Blessum has participated the past two years. Last year in Reno, his sautéed duck won second place. This year, he hopes to do even better. Associated students of Pacific Lutheran University swore in new executives President Sarah Smith and Vice President Dan Stell on Tuesday. Votes were counted and submitted March 21st, and ASPLU announced the new executives through Facebook. The new leadership duo stressed the Microsoft has introduced its answer to Siri. It's called Cortana, named after the artificial intelligence character in the video game Halo. Cortana replaces the search function on the new Windows Phone software. Microsoft unveiled the update at its Build Developers Conference in San Francisco on Wednesday. The personal digital assistant can search the internet, set up alarms, and shift calendar appointments, among other things. This afternoon, David Letterman announced he will be retiring from Late Show in 2015. He made the announcement during the taping of tonight's episode of Late Night. The 66-year-old cited his reason for leaving was because he wanted to spend more time with his family. And with his 67th birthday a week away, it seems appropriately timed. The Late Show with David Letterman has been airing for 21 years now on CBS. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this commercial break. Next is Beyond the Brochure with Amy Jones. This week, she'll be sitting down with David Leon, admin of the Facebook page PLU Confess. So here's the deal. I can show you a bunch of footage of third world countries with starving children and roofless shacks. But you've seen that all before. I can play on your emotions and explain to you why you have it so good and you owe it to the world to go out there and help others. But you already know that. The truth is, this is nothing new to you. But the world is still waiting, waiting for people like you. So what are you waiting for? Peace Corps. Life is calling. How far will you go? This new phone is awesome. It has made my life so much easier. You know, I get kind of bored when I'm driving, and I need to know what's going on. So now, with this huge screen, a keyboard, and a ton of apps, I can get a text and write back right away, no problem. It's like I barely even have to look at it. Welcome back to News at Nine. I'm Amy Jones with Beyond the Brochure, and this week we'll be interviewing David Lyon. 
Ad administrator for the PLU Confess Facebook page, where lutes are urged to submit their confessions anonymously. So, first of all, David, let's talk about why you decided to start PLU Confess. Uh, well, it actually started with a conversation with a friend about the other previous confessions pages and how they just suddenly disappeared off the radar uh, one day, and uh, people were asking questions and like gossiping and. I, I was confused too because I, I loved the pages and I loved posting to them and so I decided to create my own confessions page because I'm always on Facebook and I thought it would be a great idea because I'd be able to find out like why and what happened to cause the other admins to shut down their pages and it turned out it was just like minor technical difficulties with the website sources they were using to create the surveys. Mm -hmm. So how did you get around that? Uh, well, I use SurveyMonkey, and I think that's the site they use too, but uh, there's two versions of the site. There's one where you get it free, which is the basic version, but there's limitations to it. So like, you can create one survey with a, a limit of 100 responses per survey, and then the, the paid version, you get an unlimited amount of responses for each survey, and it's just all these um, extra add-ons to the surveys that you could use, but uh, I found out that the problem they had was they didn't know they could create multiple surveys. He thought they had the limit of only one survey and then 100 responses. And so when they reached that cap, they had to shut down their pages. OK, so what do you think this outlet brings to our campus? I think it's a good uh, way for people to vent just their thoughts, ideas, opinions about things. And the best part is it's, I mean, a lot of the content it may not necessarily even be true. I mean, some people will make things up. but. It's a way for them to just be themselves, to just let it out. So are you happy with some of the confessions that come onto the page? Because I know that sometimes, apparently, there are some pretty risque confessions coming up on there. Oh, there's so many risque confessions. Uh, I, I don't really um, side with anyone on their opinion regarding the posts. I, I created so that everyone could have a voice. And I'm happy with it, just because there's so much variety. and. Usually when I'm looking at the post and reviewing them, I crack up just because it's just a lot of things people say. I'm just like, this is so absurd that like, I'm glad that you're sitting here because then other people can see it and laugh. So I know there's been some conversations regarding racism, sexism, LGBT rights, and most recently feminism yes. has been an issue on the page. What do you think of those conversations? I think that they're interesting and that they're necessary to be had because a lot of people who come into those conversations, they believe that their, their opinions and their background in that subject um, is what is right. And then they find out that someone else was raised with the same background, but they have a different opinion about it. And so it's like, it's this exchange, this dialogue that they have, and it may not necessarily be constructive, but uh, it gets out in the open and people can learn and grow from each other if they choose. So you, use, you, you see this as a tool to facilitate, facilitate discussion? Yeah, to an extent. Some people just like to pick fights. Pe a lot of people are passive aggressive on that site. So how do you moderate some of the confessions? Um, well, I review each um, confession that comes through the survey individually. And uh, when I see one that specifically targets someone and blatantly is an attack against them, um, I'll look up the person on Facebook and try to contact them if I can. And uh, I ask them for their permission to post the confession and if they do, I post a confession, and then I comment below it, telling everyone on Facebook that I have the permission of this person to post this confession about them. Because in the past, I've had Facebook warnings because people have taken the liberty to report me through the Facebook page. And so I remember a few weeks back, I had this Facebook post about a certain person without their permission, and then someone reported that and I was blocked out of Facebook for an uh, entire day. No access to anything Facebook related. Wow, so going back to that discussion about Facebook and administrative privileges, what has the PLU administration said about this? What are their concerns? Well, they contacted me and uh, I mean, what I gathered was they can't technically do anything because they don't have the identity of the posters, but that it was more of a concern for me and my identity because I was visible and I made myself known. And so they thought it would make me an easy target for people to harass, but it's not really been a big deal. Okay, so what's a television sta safe confession that has, has stood out to you? It was uh, one, uh, not too long ago, it was um, 
the posts about President Christ, and they were like these confessions formatted in uh, the way that like Chuck Norris jokes are made. And I remember in one night there was like over 70 posts alone about President Christ, and uh, people chimed in. <laughs> and there were people who loved it, people who hated it, and a lot of people argued about it for hours. And then I just thought it was interesting and a little funny because I was just sitting there reading these people's responses to these posts, and I was like. What are you doing with your life? <laughs> it's just a Facebook post. So have you experienced firsthand a positive effect yes. of this page? Yes. Um, I've had people who are um, not necessarily as outgoing and I guess I, I introverted people really um, who have contacted me and like have had discussions with me about topics on the page like feminism, LGBTQ rights, all that stuff. And they feel like they're, they're safe and um, open to talk to me because I am so vocal about my opinions and so secure with who I am and I'm so visible. And so they can approach me and it's easy to access me as a resource to other resources to answer their questions. So what about the negative aspects of this page? How do you feel it's possibly been problematic? I guess the negative aspects would be that a lot of people take um, a lot of the content on the page so literally, so to heart. Like every single post, someone will have a very volatile reaction towards maybe because they don't agree with that post. Because it could be someone's opinion about a topic that someone feels strongly about. Mm -hmm. And so they like to argue about it. Or, you know, the other thing is a lot of people like to be passive aggressive. And so they attack other people on that page. and they feel they have the freedom to do so because they are protected, their identity is not out in the open. And so that's been one of the negative things is that people are able to harass each other and bully each other much more easily. So uh, in going back to the bullying aspect, how do you think the anonymous aspect of this page affects what goes on? The anonymous aspect affects the page in a lot of ways. Like I said, it protects people, but it also harms them because the bullies can protect themselves and those who are being bullied can't protect themselves because they can't review who they are because that would make it easier for the bullies to target them and harass them. And so it's just, it's trying to balance the two. Okay, so do you, I know people have asked this before, but do you plan on continuing the site after you graduate? Oh, definitely. You know we're going to run it better than me. <laughs> and what's your favorite part? My favorite part is just seeing all the different posts and people's thoughts about things and like sometimes it can be something random like someone discovered like a new ice cream from like another country and then they freak out and I'm like yes this is real life this is happening all over the world you're not alone this is cool so with that that's all the time we have for tonight up next is sports talk with Sam Horn and Giancarlo Santoro and we'll see you next time They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Said a bottle couldn't see the ocean. Give up. Go back to the dumpster. But I didn't listen. I made my way. And now, I am what I've always wanted to be. Welcome back to News at Nine. I'm Sam Horn, and you're watching Sports Talk. Today, I'm joined by Giancarlo Santoro. He has been actively reporting on the sports scene during his time at PLU, and it's great to have him behind the anchor desk tonight. I'm excited to be a part of Sports Talk. Let's see what's going on this week in sports. Good idea, G. Let's jump right into it. Over spring break, both tennis teams traveled down to the sunny state of California to have some fun in the sun and also play some tennis. The men's tennis team hasn't gotten off to a great start this year as the Lutes boast a 2-9 record. I think boast might be the wrong word to use, Sam. 
You know what, G, I think you're right. Their record is nothing to boast about, especially since they lost three out of four matches this past weekend. The men's tennis team began their California road trip with an 8-1 loss against Caltech. First year, Sam Statter was the only loot to win, taking number one singles 6-3 and 6-1, but things didn't get much better from there on. That's a fact, G. Next up for the Lutes was Arizona Christian, who smashed the Lutes 6-3. Junior Spencer Heron was the lone singles player to earn a victory for the Lutes. Two of PLU's men's doubles teams earned a victory as well. Chapman roasted the Lutes 8-1 during the next match. PLU avoided the sweep by winning one doubles match. While the Lutes did lose to Biola, they did earn their only victory against Hope International, winning 5-4. First year James Abuko and sophomore Jeremy Marsh won two of the singles matches for the Lutes, while PLU's doubles teams swept the competition. Unlike the men's team, the women's team found slightly more success down in California. The women won two out of four matches, beating Cal Lutheran and Occidental. Their losses, though, were ugly. Caltech beat down the women's team 9-0, while Whittier also put a whipping on the Lutes, winning 8-1. First year Emily Boer was a solo Lute to capture victory, winning in the number six singles slot. The men's tennis team's next match is Friday against Pacific. The game will be played in Oregon at 4 p.m. As for the women, their next match is also against Pacific. Lucky for you, Loot fans, their match will be played at home. Match time is 3.30 p.m. Now to the softball field. The softball team is the unfortunate recipient of a two-game losing streak. March 30th, the team played Linfield, splitting the doubleheader. The softball team's first game was a success. They won 7-5. While Linfield did get on the board first with a two-run inning in the second, the Lutes managed to compose themselves and get back on track for the win. Katie Lowry blasted a solo shot over the fence in the bottom of the second inning. The Lutes continued to pile on the runs as they accounted for five in the fourth inning. Just for good measure, the Lutes tacked on one more insurance run in the seventh to secure the victory. Sure, the Lutes did win their first game against Linfield, but their second game didn't turn out too well. PLU only managed to score two runs compared to five from Linfield, so you could say it was a bad day at the office for the Lutes. Pitcher Kelsey Robinson got her eighth loss of the season and was only able to strike out two batters. Moving to their next game, the Lutes squared off against Willamette on Monday. Unfortunately for PLU, the Bearcats clawed their way to a 5-2 win. None of the Lute batters tallied more than one hit. The Lutes played George Fox in McMinnville, Oregon to make up for a game that was postponed in late February. You know, G, I wish I could brighten the mood just a little bit, but unfortunately the baseball team lost multiple games over spring break. After landing in California during spring break, the Lutes took a while to recover from the flight, but after a while, they did get back on track. The first game of spring break was against Pomona College. Pomona immediately jumped out to an early lead. Colin Nilsson and Bo Pearson led the way for the Lutes with two hits apiece, but it was not enough to hold off Pomona College. The Lutes went on to, to lose 7-2. To During the second game, the Lutes struggled to break into the run column against Cal Lutheran. While their offense couldn't score a run, the Lutes pitching staff could only hold off the Cal Lutheran bats for so long. Trevor Lubkin got his first loss of the season, and the Lutes lost 3-0. You have to wonder if maybe jet lag contributed to their poor performance. Well, the team did not travel into a different time zone, but it could definitely be a distinct possibility. Jet lag or whatever prevented the, the Lutes from actually winning their first two games of spring break vanished during the second set of games. The next two games were against Claremont, and boy, did the Lutes take advantage of their opponent's poor pitching. In two games combined, Claremont gave up 22 runs. Well, 22 runs, seven doubles, and one home run to be exact. The Lutes' explosive offense was highlighted by Tyler Thompson, who hit two doubles and drove in a run over the course of two games. The Lutes will take on 2013 national champion Linfield this weekend in what is a highly anticipated matchup. And that's an understatement. This game has the potential to decide who will win the Northwest Conference this year. Very true, G. Junior Hannah Walton will be competing in the Northwest Conference Trek Championship next week after qualifying in the heptathlon. The PLU track team is off to a hot start because of athletes like Hannah Walton. Only a month into the season, Walton has already qualified for the Northwest Conference Championships in the Women's Heptathlon. Track and field wasn't always Walton's favorite sport. The junior also played soccer at a young age. In high school, I realized that I'm just, I was going, 
I was doing better things in track. I was actually growing as an athlete, and in soccer I really wasn't. And I really like the fact that in track it's you can't blame it on someone else, like your performance. Like that's all on you, but you saw this team aspect, and I love that. It's just like it just fits me perfectly. Both of Walton's parents played sports at PLU and persuaded their daughter to attend their alma mater. My mom did soccer and cross country here, and my dad played football. I should play a sport at Paleo, and then I was good enough to do track here. So. Walton has her sights set on engineering school after graduating from PLU. I am going to try to work right after college so I can get money and go to grad school for engineering. Let's focus our attention for just a moment on college athletics on a national scale. Gee, what do you think about uh, college fo football players trying to unionize? Well, to me, I think it really just goes against the whole point of college athletics. College athletes are amateurs who are trying to build their way up to the professional level, and I think that if they're to be paid for competing, it would really just change the whole dynamic of trying to work towards becoming a professional. I definitely agree, G. I couldn't believe when the former quarterback of Northwestern, Kane Coulter, said that he thinks colleges give athletic scholarships to student athletes just to force them to focus on athletics and not on academics. That just makes no sense whatsoever. They're just wasting their experience in college if all they're focused on is ath athletics and not seeking a better future for themselves. Want to join the conversation? Be sure to comment on our website. I believe that's all the time we have tonight. We'll see you next Thursday at 9. Check us out anytime at massmedia.plu.edu. He's Sam Horn. I'm John Carlos Santoro. For all the news at 9 Crew, good night.